Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series in which we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at a build featuring the possible god that couldn't be bothered to combat against Sauron, Tom Bombadil. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content, and if you really like it, please consider supporting the channel directly through Buy Me A Coffee or through our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see which commanders we'll be covering next, and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Tom Bombadil is a 4-4 god bard that costs Wooburg and has the following two abilities. Firstly, as long as there are four or more lore counters among sagas we control, Tom Bombadil has Hexproof and Indestructible. And secondly, whenever the final chapter ability of a saga we control resolves, we reveal cards off the top of our deck until we reveal a saga card and put that card into play, sending the rest to the bottom of our deck in a random order, limited to once per turn. Breaking down his core stats, Tom is sporting a decently hefty and color-intensive CMC, a slightly below average stat block for his cost, and a pair of abilities that enable Sagas to protect him, while he in turn enables them to replace themselves once they complete. Taking a closer look at his second ability first, since it's arguably the more powerful of the two, it simply allows any saga we're able to complete all the chapters on to replace itself with a fresh one from our deck once per turn. Now, that saga will be completely random, but there is no chance it will quote unquote miss so long as we have sagas left in the deck, costs no mana, and approx any payoffs we may have that care about sagas or enchantments entering the battlefield, making it an excellent source of value if we're going to be dedicating a good portion of our deck into sagas anyway. And it should be noted that this ability can be triggered once each turn, not just on our turn, making it procable multiple times per rotation for even more value if we're able to add counters to our sagas at instant speed. This then leads nicely into Tom's first ability, which provides him with very solid destruction and targeting protection so long as we have enough sagas with lore counters in play, making it almost impossible for our opponents to get rid of him outside of non-destruction, non-targeting edicts and wipes, which is a good thing since our opponents typically won't waste any time in removing him if he's vulnerable to prevent us from generating value off of him. So, as we can see based on his abilities, Tom Bombadil is clearly a Saga-focused commander, aiming to use Sagas to protect himself and enabling our Sagas to replace themselves upon their completion, which is why in this build we'll be running no shortage of powerful Sagas to benefit and enable his effects, ranging from core stat improving Sagas to serve as the ramp draw removal and wipes in this build, to more board presence generating focused entrance to help bolster our low creature count via creating tokens bodies or by turning themselves into creatures upon completion. Running sagas though is only half the battle, since our opponents are not likely going to simply let us play our commander on an unprotected board and generate value off of him. So, in order to protect him, as well as to get extra uses out of our sagas, we'll be running various means to both uptick and downtick the lore counters on our sagas to initially ensure they stick around for longer to prevent our commander from being removed, and later to proc and reproc their abilities again and again for repeated value. And once we've concluded this build with a standard array of enchantment payoffs to generate us even more value as we cast and or get our sagas into play, we'll be left with a build that can completely take over the game via the effects of our sagas by stretching a simple three chapter story into a full blown novel, whether our opponents want to hear it or not. So let us make our way back to Middle Earth one more time, this time to the western end of the old forest. We're under a steep cliff, we'll find a modest home built upon a grassy knoll. Known to the locals' nobility and even Gandalf himself, this little place is Underhill, the home of our commander, Tom Bombadil, and his beautiful wife, Goldberry, where they live a quiet, carefree life together. But despite his humble residence and unassuming appearance, the jolly old man who resides here should not be taken lightly. 
He has proven that the ring has no power over him, and the songs he sings seem to transform and change anything and everything within his domain. So much power he wields that even Elrond, Lord of Rivendell, suggested that he take the ring to Mordor, though Gandalf brushed aside this idea, as Tom had so little interest in the ring that he was just as likely to forget about it or lose it. But whether he be a god, one of the angels that shaped Middle-earth, or something else entirely, if you were to ask him about it, you would likely get this answer in the form of a rhyme. Old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow, bright blue his jacket is, and his boots are yellow. None has ever caught him yet, for Tom, he is the master. His songs are stronger songs, and his feet are faster. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Opening with our creature base first, it'll mostly consist of creatures who can either manipulate the lore counters on our sagas to get additional uses out of them, or instead creatures that care about enchantments to generate value off of our sagas as we cast them, use them, or even lose them. In the former category, we'll start off by running Goldberry River Daughter, Scholar of New Horizons, and a Thrall Parasite as a trio of entrants whose activated abilities allow us to remove lore counters from our sagas to have them stick around for longer, with the first two also providing us with either ramp or draw as they do so, as well as Ferropede and Glissa Sunslayer, whose on-damage effects allow them to remove some or even all of our lore counters off of our sagas, with both also being easily able to get in for damage thanks to either being completely unblockable in the former's case, or possessing the very annoying keyword combination of First Strike and Death Touch in the latter's, while also alternatively being able to provide targeted enchantment removal or repeatable draw instead. Then on the flip side of the equation, we have Grateful Apparition and Thrumming Bird, which will be slotting in as on damage sources of Proliferate to tick up our sagas faster so they can accumulate more lore counters and reach multiple chapters on a single turn and Satsuki the Living Lore joining us as our last lore counter manipulator, who can instead use her tap effect to uptick all our sagas simultaneously on our turn, and whose on death effect helps us reuse a saga by either bouncing it back from play or recurring it from our graveyard to be used again. And then on the Enchantments Matter side of things, we'll be running the standard enchantment themed draw package consisting of Sithis Harvest's Hand, Seder Enchanter, Verdurian Enchantress, Sithis Enchampion, and Eidolon of Blossoms. The first three drawing us a card whenever we cast an enchantment, while the latter two instead draw us a card whenever an enchantment ETB is under our control to proc off our commander's effect making them generally better than their predecessors, but all five are excellent sources of repeatable on-theme draw to continually generate us card advantage. We'll then also be adding the ramp-focused enchantment payoffs, Chukai Naturalist and Sanctum Weaver, both of which are enchantments themselves to proc our other payoffs, and provide either passive cost reduction for all our sagas and other enchantments, or a huge amount of colored mana that scales with the number of enchantments we have in play to help us cast any of our spells. Then as some less core stat-focused enchantment payoffs, we'll be including the legends Gen Arcanum Weaver and Hannah Ship's Navigator as means to reuse our completed sagas from our graveyard. The former by sacking another enchantment, preferably a weaker saga, to reanimate them, while the latter simply recurs it back to our hand, as well as adding Yenna Red Tooth Regent and Weaver of Harmony as ways for us to get extra mileage out of our sagas by either creating token copies of them, which also nets us extra lore counters too as a bonus to enable Tom's protection, or by simply copying their abilities. Though do keep in mind that these effects can be applied to any of our enchantments if we need them to. And finally, reaching the last of our creatures, Narcy Fablesinger earns a spot on this list as a fantastic saga-specific payoff that not only generates us repeatable card advantage as our sagas complete, but also turns those sagas into AoE life drain to whittle down our opponent's life totals while padding our own as she does so. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. 
Due to our build's focus on enchantments, our instant category is going to be quite small this time around, and will entirely consist of ways to manipulate the lore counters on our sagas, with Flicker of Fate and Scroll Shift making it into the final build as ways to quote unquote reset our sagas back to a single lore counter by flickering them, which can alternatively be used to save our sagas and our creatures from targeted removal if needed, and Clock Spinning joining us as our only other instant that, thanks to buyback, serves as a repeatable way for us to uptick or downtick our sagas on any player's turn, which is a fantastic way to proc Tom's ability multiple times per rotation, provided we have the mana to do so. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Like the previous category, we'll only be running a small handful of sorceries so we can make more room for our enchantments. With the sorceries that we will be running primarily consisting of the Land Ramp sources, Rampant Growth, Nature's Lore, Far Seek, Cultivate, and Kodama's Reach, to help speed up and fix our 5 color mana base to ensure we can reliably cast our sagas and our commander without worrying about not having access to a particular color. Then as the last and only non-ramp sorcery in the build, we have the enchantment reanimating Dance of the Mance joining our arsenal, which is a fantastic way for us to reuse our previously completed sagas by reanimating them from the bin, and, if we're able to pump enough mana into it, also turns those sagas into creatures so we can build up our board state with them. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Finally reaching the backbone of our build, it should come as no surprise that we'll be running a huge selection of sagas with a variety of different effects to help enable our commander's game plan, ranging from improving our core stats, building up our board states, and even providing some more unique utility outside of that. Starting off with our core stat improving sagas, we'll be slotting in Azusa's Many Journeys and Jugan Defends the Temple, as ramp providing sagas via their additional land drop granting and mana dork creation that also help build up our board state by transforming into creatures upon their completion, providing us with repeatable land untapping and plus one plus one counter distribution when they do so, the Weather Seed Treaty and Binding the Old Gods as land ramp sources that fetch us up any basic or forest from our deck into play respectively to help speed up and fix our mana base further, with the former also providing board presence via its token creation while the latter provides targeted permanent destruction instead, and the restoration of a ganjo as technically another land ramp source via its ability to tutor up a planes to our hand with its first chapter, then letting us discard any land and reanimate it with its second, essentially making it a very slow rampant growth, but one that also gives us a decent sized body that we can use to create tokens to help build up our board state with. We'll then also be running Song of Arendelle and the Bath Song as sources of card advantage and ramp, the former via its treasure token generation and the latter via the double blue mana it generates on our main one, while also providing additional utility via permanently making our creatures evasive or shuffling our graveyard back into our deck respectively. The first to row in games as even more draw and ramp that allow us to turn Tom into a 7-7 via plus one plus one counter distribution and an Etsasa token body as well, and a scroll of Isildur as yet another source of card advantage that will generally draw us at least two via the creatures it taps down and stuns on its second chapter, and possibly even more if our opponents attack in before the turn gets back to us, as well as serving as a very easy way for us to steal away our opponents mana rocks and utility artifacts that we can proc over and over again thanks to our build's counter manipulation. And while on the topic of removal via theft, the Akroan War and the Horus Heresy will be joining our arsenal as even more ways for us to steal our opponent's creatures away from them, potentially indefinitely and repeatedly if we can keep removing the lore counters off of them, that also provide additional utility via their AoE pseudo goad and wipe, or their draw and removal respectively along with the Trickster God's Heist as a permanent theft effect to use against both our opponent's best creatures and non-creatures, provided of course we're willing to give them one of our many tokens for their trouble. Then as one last piece of non-traditional removal, we'll be running Inventive Iteration as Bounce Removal to help us deal with our opponent's creatures and walkers, which also provides us with Artifact Recursion or Draw if we have no artifacts to recur, and its final chapter turning it into an absolutely infuriating stacks piece that can severely limit the spells our opponents can cast per rotation, especially if we're able to cast multiple different CMC spells per turn. 
Then moving on to sagas that provide more traditional removal, the Kami War and Elspeth Conquer's Death both provide us with excellent exile-based removal on their first chapters, which are very easy for us to get additional uses out of, on top of the huge evasive body and recursion, or the slowdown and reanimation they provide if we allow them to complete, while the Eldest Reborn and Birth of the Imperium instead provide removal via their AoE enemy-only edicts to help bypass conventional targeting protection and hit multiple targets, as well as allowing us to either reanimate our opponent's creatures or draw us cards upon their completion. And then concluding our core stat-focused sagas, Phyrexian Scriptures gives us a straightforward way for us to retake control of the board that our commander can live through thanks to his indestructibility, while we can use it to save another one of our creatures, on top of being a solid source of AoE graveyard hate to combat against graveyard-focused builds, and the Elder Dragon War serves as a decent mini-wipe to deal with smaller creatures that, if we hit it off our commander at a bad time, we can always use its read ahead to skip the wipe and either use it as a loot effect to help prune our hands or as a way to create a 4-4 flying token to build up our board with. Then moving on to some sagas that help build up our board even more, we'll be running Furja's Retribution as another way for us to create a 4-4 flyer, an angel this time, to block and swing in with, as well as a way to empower all our other angels via turning them into removal and granting them double strike, which will be relevant later. The Huntsman's Redemption is essentially a 3-3 for 3 that gives us the option to use the token it creates or any one of our other creatures to use it as a creature or land tutor, which helps us search up a lot of our payoffs to help improve consistency, and there and back again serves as a means for us to get a gigantic 6-6 flyer onto the field that generates us a staggering 14 treasures if our opponents are able to get rid of it, in addition to also limiting blocks and land ramping us for a non-basic mountain on top of that. Apprentice's Folly will then wrap up our creature token creating sagas that, while being unable to produce tokens on its own, does allow us to create token copies of our creatures, including our legendaries, easily enabling us to double up on our most powerful payoffs like our commander and, thanks to our counter manipulation, being able to do so for longer without fear of losing our tokens through its final chapter. And then as our last remaining sagas on our list, we have War of the Last Alliance and the Cruelty of Gix joining us as tutors that improve the build's consistency by either fetching up our large amount of legendary creatures or anything from our deck, making them superb ways for us to consistently get to our payoffs, and Machiko's Reign of Truth closes out this lot as an enchantment payoff that grows our creatures based on the number of enchantments we have in play before turning itself into a creature that has the same effect to further bolster our board presence. Then switching gears to the non-Saga enchantment payoff enchantments we'll be running, Sterling Grove makes it into the build as both a way to protect our Sagas from removal as well as a way to tutor for those Sagas, though do keep in mind that the Shroud it grants our Sagas does prevent us from targeting them with a good portion of our counter manipulation, so be sure to sack it away for its tutor effect if you need to target them. Enchantress's Presence slots in as yet another source of repeatable draw as we cast our enchantments, this time from the relative safety of our back row, and a Sigil of the Empty Throne makes the grade as a way to tack on 4-4 Flying Angels to every enchantment spell we cast to further build up our board. And at last, reaching our final enchantment and the singular Saga's Matter payoff in this category, we have Historian's Boon, which creates 1-1 tokens whenever an enchantment ETBs under our control, and a 4-4 Flying and Vigilant Angel token whenever we resolve a Saga's final chapter, giving us yet another way to build up our board with token bodies, this time that procs whenever our Saga's enter and leave play. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Reaching our artifact slot, we're back again to just a handful of entries primarily dedicated to improving our mana base. With the Mana Rock Soul Ring and Arcane Signet, along with the Land Ramp Source Wayfarer's Bauble, all providing one last boost to our mana base's speed and consistency. And then as our only other, non-ramp focused artifact entrant, Power Conduit makes it into the build as a cheap source of counter manipulation that we can use on the turn it comes down to remove counters off of our sagas, while simultaneously making our resilient commander even bigger by loading him up with plus one plus one counters, turning him into a more and more dangerous threat while enabling our sagas to stick around for longer. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our land base. 
Quickly going over this build's mana lands, we'll be running Command Tower, Path of Ancestry, and Exotic Orchard as lands that tap for most or all of our colors to help improve consistency. The tapped tri lands Frontier Bivouac, Jungle Shrine, Opulent Palace, Sandsteep Citadel, Savage Lands, and a Seaside Citadel as slow but reliable access to 3 out of 5 of our colors, especially green to help us cast our ramp spells and speed up and fix our mana base even further. Murmuring Bosk is another tapped tri land that may cost life to tap for white and black, but makes up for it by being a forest, which a variety of our land ramp sources can fetch up for us. The Battle Lands, Canopy Vista, Cinder Glade, Prairie Stream, Smoldering Marsh, and Sunken Hollow, as dual lands which again possess basic land types to make them fetchable by some of our land ramp, and can often come into play untapped thanks to our land ramp suite fetching up basics. The Pain Lands, Battlefield Forge, Caves of Koilos, Lanoir Wastes, Shiv and Reef, and Yavamaya Coast, as even more duels that help us fix our mana at the cost of life initially, that we can later tap for colorless once we get access to those colors through other means, and lastly, the slow fetches, evolving wilds, and terramorphic expanse, providing the build with one last bit of fixing for any of our colors, as well as getting basics out of our deck and into play to make it more likely we draw into gas and to have our battle lands come into play untapped. And finally, we'll be running four plains, two islands, two swamps, two mountains, and four forests as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 21 creatures including our commander, 3 instants, 6 sorceries, 30 enchantments, 4 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have a total of 35 cards that are considered enchantments, 26 of which are sagas, 21 cards that care about enchantments, 4 cards that specifically care about sagas, 5 ways to recur or reanimate our sagas from our bin, 12 ways to manipulate the lore counters on our sagas, and 20 ways to use our enchantments to generate board presence via token creation or by them turning into creatures, giving us a solid saga-focused enchantment build with plenty of payoffs to generate value for us as we cast them, a decent number of ways for us to get additional uses out of our sagas by taking counters off of them while they're in play to reproc their chapters, or by bringing them back into play once they've concluded to be used again, and even shoring up the deck's lack of creatures in the 99 by providing us with a respectable number of enchantments to build up our board state with. Then for general deck stats, we have 20 ramp sources, 17 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 3 board wipes. With our ramp and draw being much higher than average due to our need to reliably get the mana necessary to cast our commander, and to dig for the sagas we need to enable and take advantage of his abilities. Looking at our mana curve, we have 4 1 drops, 19 2 drops, 17 3 drops, 14 4 drops, 8 5 drops, and 2 6 drops, leaving us with a mid-weight curve that aims to ramp hard in the early game to fix our color intensive mana base, and after we've done so, we'll start playing our sagas and try to keep them around for as long as we can via our counter manipulation sources to keep procking their effects. Then, once we have enough sagas in play, we can drop in our commander as an indestructible and untargetable body to protect us, while we strategically let our weakest sagas complete to be replaced with hopefully more powerful ones from our deck. Then from there, we can simply continue to reproc our saga's most powerful abilities again and again to generate us value, pick apart our opponent's boards, and or grow our boards, until our opponents inevitably fall before the power of our commander's endless sagas. This deck is currently valued at $64.92, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, we can consider exchanging Yenna Red Tooth Regent for Archon of Sun's Grace if we want more ways to generate bodies off our enchantments as they enter play over getting more copies of our enchantments themselves. Phyrexian Scriptures can be traded for Brago King Eternal if we want more ways to quote unquote reset our Saga's lore counters to one every turn by flickering them, by reducing our ability to reliably wipe the board, and Clock Spinning can be replaced with One Ring to Rule Them All if instead we want more ways ways to keep the board clear of threats that our commander is immune to over getting more mileage out of our sagas. 
And as a side note, we can look at replacing any of our more expensive dual lands with nesting grounds and or Karn's Bastion to provide us with even more ways to manipulate our Saga's lore counters, but since they're colorless, they do run the risk of making it harder to cast our commander, so run at your discretion. Then for upgrades, Thrumming Bird can be replaced with Starfield of Nyx as a repeatable way for us to reanimate our sagas and, eventually, to turn them into bodies for us to swing in with. On a ship's navigator can be benched to make room for Jenga Taxis, whose front face is an excellent source of passive card advantage for us as we cast the majority of our sagas, and whose back face, the Great Synthesis, provides even more draw, a board wipe, and a torrent of free spells when it concludes while also proccing our commander. Fridge's Retribution can be exchanged for Battle at the Hell Vault to provide us with an even bigger angel, and, while we build up to it, repeatable exile-based removal to delay our opponent's biggest threats while we lose our weakest. The Trickster God's Heist can be slotted out so we can slot in Kaora Best's The Sea God, which is an even better source of permanent theft that also drops a gigantic body into play and taps down an opponent's board for a full rotation, and Thrall Parasite can be upgraded to Hex Parasite to be used as a repeatable source of instant speed counter manipulation so long as we have the mana or life to pay for it. And lastly, we can cut Grateful Apparition to add in one more Praetor in the form of Shuldred, whose front face is a decent enemy-only AoE edict, and whose back face, the True Scriptures, is another saga that provides even more AoE removal, enemy hand attack, and concludes with a Rise of the Dark Realms to reanimate our opponent's entire dead creature base to use against them, ultimately making her both powerful and on theme while not actually costing us too much out of pocket. Provided, of course, we're willing to skip going out to lunch to buy a piece of cardboard. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we continue, I would first like to take a moment to thank all the channel subscribers for having helped us reach the 14.5k subscriber milestone. The 15k subscriber milestone is just under 500 subs away thanks to all of your support, and, as usual, I have something planned to celebrate. So be sure to stay tuned for that as a thank you for having helped the channel grow. Now, taking a look at our upcoming commander builds, next week's commander build will be featuring the Flash Speed Matters commander, Alayla Cunning Conqueror, and the following week, last week's poll winner, Ariette of the Charmed Apple, will be getting a build of her own where she'll be using auras for fun and profit. So look forward to those two builds coming soon. Then moving on to this week's poll, this week's contenders will entirely consist of suggestions posted in the comments of previous videos and polls. Those being the New High King, Will Scion of Peace, the adventurous Beluna Grand Squall, and the edible knight, Sir Ginger the Meal Ender. So please, cast your votes in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and which commanders you want to see me feature in future polls. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you're feeling particularly generous, feel free to keep me caffeinated via buying me a coffee at the link in the description, or alternatively, use our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description if you're looking to purchase sealed MTG product, accessories, board games, or any of their other wide selection of products at low prices that include free shipping for orders over $75, and a rewards program that builds up store credit over time as you make your purchases. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the cut-rate commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.